Thanks for that, Cohen. Lord, I ask that you'd speak through me now and give us all a heart to hear what you might be telling each of us this morning. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm just going to be reflecting on the passage that we've just heard and, uh, and reflecting on how it fits with Advent and the, the themes that we've heard so far from our young people. I want to start by asking you a question. Uh, how do we wait? How do we wait or how do you wait? How do you go when it comes to waiting? Sometimes I was reflecting on this, sometimes it feels as if our entire lives are sort of comprised of distinct periods of waiting. Sometimes they're connected by sort of periods of milestones, but often it's periods of waiting, 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 waiting for something else. I remember being a child and I remember reflecting, I remember waiting for all sorts of things. As a kid, you sort of, there's always things that you're waiting for. At this time of year, maybe you're waiting for Christmas. It feels like an eternity. You've only had five or six Christmases in your whole life, so to wait for another one, that feels like such a long time. Uh, I remember waiting for the school year as a primary school kid, the waiting for the next school year over the sort of six-week summer break. That six-week break feels like an age. It feels like an entire year unto itself almost. Uh, and I remember, I remember most of all as a child waiting for that feeling of what it would be like to be a grown-up. I remember thinking like, oh, wow, I can't wait to be a grown-up. I can't wait to, to be all grown-up, to be an adult. Of course, you realise at some point that you never quite fully realise that feeling. You never quite get there, but uh, you, get, you get closer to it. And kids might not realise that adults are waiting for things just as much as you are. And for the adults in the room, I wonder what you've waited for in your life or what maybe you're waiting for currently. Perhaps you're waiting for another child. Maybe you're waiting for your... Maybe you're waiting for your children to move beyond that sort of really intense first stage of their lives. Maybe you're waiting for them to start school. Maybe you're a bit further down the track and there's part of you that's waiting for your children to be independent. You're ready for them to finish school, waiting for them to get out into the world. Maybe you're waiting for a new position at work or waiting to sell your house. Maybe you're further on and you're waiting for that first grandchild, waiting for retirement. Uh, or maybe you're like me and I'm waiting... I'm waiting for my football team of choice to claw its way out of irrelevance that it's known for the past two decades, always waiting as an Essendon supporter. But what can be the hardest thing about waiting is that ultimately none of the things that we wait for are really truly promised to us in the most complete sense. And as I, as I said, I'm, a, I'm an Essendon supporter, and if you'd asked me when I was 10 what the likelihood of Essendon being successful in the next 15 years was, I would have told you, I'm sure, that it was guaranteed. We were the best club in the land. I'm sure we would have been successful. 15 years later, you can sort of guess how that had turned out. Mary and Joseph, as we heard from Matthew, had to wait. And you might imagine that their waiting period was a little bit different to how they initially expected it to be. You've got a young couple engaged to be married and waiting for that time to come when suddenly their lives are turned completely upside down by the news that Mary is going to give birth to a son. In Psalm 80, as we've just heard, we also hear a nation that is in many ways waiting. The passage highlights a real cry of a people in the midst of turmoil and a real yearning, a real waiting for God's saving grace, a pleading with God to restore them, to make his face shine upon them, as we heard many times in that passage that they may, may be saved. The psalm encapsulates this sort of a real desperate feeling of waiting with this need for divine intervention. And the Israelites aren't just waiting for a change in their circumstances, but they're also waiting for a renewal in their relationship with God, a return to the days where they felt his presence and favour more palpably. So today I want to talk about Mary and Joseph's waiting and the waiting of Israel for a saviour that's sort of depicted in Psalm 80 in light of the sort of themes that we've heard today associated with Advent. The Psalm 80 is an interesting psalm. It's not necessarily the sort of first choice that you might choose. And when I was reflecting on sort of the readings to, to hear from this morning it's not necessarily the first choice that you might choose for a, a sermon on Advent because it's sort of, it is quite, um, 
It's quite intense. It's quite a, uh, a visceral psalm, really clearly uh, lamenting Israel's state of affairs. And you hear constantly, restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. This sort of expression of hope they have amidst the, de- the despair. But in the heart of Psalm 80, there's a real profound truth about the character of God. And that's that the psalmist doesn't just see God as this sort of distant deity, the psalmist understands that the role of God in their lives needs to be intimate, that God needs to be this figure of hope in Israel's darkness. This hope doesn't sort of, it doesn't guarantee immediate change or a quick fix to Israel's problems. And we know that there was a very long protracted period of waiting uh, that's not necessarily recorded that much in Scripture. There's 400 years of, uh, of silence, as is described, that you might imagine Israel is just in this constant period of waiting for a saviour. Uh, but it's this hope that rests in the nature of God rather than this, uh, the hope in a quick fix uh, that Israel is thinking of. Uh, it brings us to an important point about hope and waiting, and that's that our hope is so often tied to the expectation of specific outcomes. We hope for things to happen in a certain way. We wait for them to happen in line with the vision that we've created in our mind. But as we go further into Psalm 80, we see a a really challenging, and it is quite challenging, but it's, it's a necessary part of hope, and that's the reality of unfilled expectations. So we understand that the Israelites were crying out desperately for this saviour. They were crying out to be liberated, really, to have God make himself known among them. But the Israelites, when they were crying out, they were crying out for this sort of an earthly liberator. We know that's who they were waiting for. They were waiting for someone who might restore their fortunes, free them from their oppressors, re-establish the kingdom of Israel, a sort of mighty king, a powerful ruler who might overthrow their enemies, lead Israel into a new era of prosperity. And this expectation was really rooted in their their understanding, their expectation of the promises that God had made to their ancestors. And that coloured their vision of what the Messiah's arrival would mean. But we know that despite that being Israel's expectation, the fulfilment of their hope came in a form far different to what they expected. The Messiah didn't arrive as a conquering king, but as a humble servant. His kingdom was not one of political power or of military might. He wasn't a celebrity, as we heard, but it came of one of love, grace, and of spiritual transformation. Jesus came to liberate, not in the way the Israelites anticipated, but to free all of humanity from the bondage of sin and to establish a kingdom that transcends earthly boundaries, earthly kingdoms. So how might the Israelites answer that question? How do we wait? Well, perhaps it's important not to get caught up in our own expectations and understanding that waiting isn't a countdown to receiving what we desire, but rather deepening our relationship with God, putting our trust in his promises. As we wait, we can have our focus shift from our own plans and desires to God's character and God's promises. We can learn to wait with hope, not because we're certain of the outcome or what the outcome might look like, but because we're certain of God's faithfulness and love. Some of you might know that one of the biggest ways that I unwind usually is by playing computer games. Uh, And it won't come as a surprise to anyone who's visited the rectory while I've been staying there in the past few months. I figured the the empty lounge room with nothing but a television and Nintendo on a couch is probably a a bit of a giveaway. Um, And before I move on, I just wanted to address the youth uh, who I'm sure are thinking it. I promise you this anecdote is more than just an excuse to bring up the fact that I'm more than capable of beating all of you at Mario Kart. But uh, but it it might have factored in a little bit. Uh, in recent years, in recent years, as computer games have become a more a, re- a much more significant industry, just to, in case you weren't aware, maybe you weren't, um, something really interesting has happened with it, and, it, and it hasn't happened to the same extent as films or music or television. 
And that's that the people that make games, these developers, have started making really extraordinary promises. Every couple of months now, it's quite common to hear about, you, you might hear the newest game that's been announced, and this time, this time, it's going to be more realistic than ever. It's going to have the most characters, I don't know, it's going to be the best ever game. It's going to blow everyone's minds. The most, the most outlandish one of these sort of promises came a couple years ago when a developer promised, and, and this is true, a developer promised that their game was going to realistically simulate all 18 quintillion planets in the universe. They genuinely made this statement with a straight face. Every planet was going to be unique. You were going to be able to visit every planet. Now, I, I probably don't need to tell you how it ended up going. The game came out, and it turned out that Technically, there were 18 quintillion planets, but essentially they all boiled down to five or six different ones repeated over the red planet, the green planet, the blue planet, the hot planet, the, whole, the cold planet. There wasn't really 18 quintillion unique planets. They didn't really manage to simulate the entire universe. And yet, for a number of people that were waiting, people were shocked. People were really surprised and they were outraged. They'd been lied to, and this was an injustice that just could not be allowed to take place. There were protests, genu genuine protests, and they vowed they would never fall for these fake promises again. Of course, until the next game came around, probably about six months later, promising some other grand feat, and you can imagine how it went. It keeps happening, and if you, if you play games at all, you'll know what I talk about. There's this constant cycle of promises and then disappointment, and then, oh, we're not going to fall for it once more, and then you know, more promises, and oh, maybe this time, maybe this time they're actually going to live up to it. And the truth is, is that none of our promises that we, that we feel as if we're promised to on earth can really be sure. It can be quite easy to be caught up in that sort of that hype cycle of earthly promises, whether it's the promise of something new and revolutionary, maybe it's the promise of a new job, a change in life circumstances. We can place our hope in these promises, but they're so often fragile, subject to change, and often they're just outright misleading. They don't end up being anything like how we expect them to be. And it brings us to Mary and Joseph, one of the few, some of the few human beings in history that have received a personal promise that they can know is sure. What a privilege that must have been. Unlike the fleeting and uncertain promises that they might receive in their earthly lives, the promise they received was given to them from God himself, immutable and eternal. And the promise wasn't about immediate gratification or earthly triumphs. It was about the fulfilment of God's redemptive plan for humanity, a plan that had been unfolding since the dawn of time. And this certainty in the promise they'd received allowed Mary and Joseph to have peace, a peace that didn't come from the knowledge of how things would play out or from a guarantee of an easy path ahead. What's interesting is in God's promise to Mary and Joseph, he didn't promise that they would be free from scandal or free from earthly pain or free from hardship. It was a really monumental task that they were, they were tasked with, being tasked with playing a really key role in God's redemptive plan. But we can see how they responded in their actions, and we can see how they must have, they must have received this sense of peace. In the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of almost certain scandal, the enormity of their calling, they waited with a deep sense of peace a peace that didn't come from knowing the specifics of how everything would unfold, but a peace that came from trusting in the one who made the promise. Their waiting was a journey of faith, a testament to their trust in God's plan and faithfulness. So I'm going to finish, but I want to leave you with this. How do we wait? Perhaps we wait like Mary and Joseph with a steadfast faith in God's promises knowing that he who has begun a good work in us will carry it on to completion. May this season of Advent be a time of meaningful waiting for you, filled with the peace, hope and joy that comes in trusting in God's sure promises.